Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about grass seed, and we'd like to thank Sony Anak for giving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts in Canada. And if you live outside the U.S., send us an email. I'd be curious where you're listening from. Early lawns in Europe were planted with moss, chamomile, or thyme rather than grass. Is it chamomile? Chamomile? Yeah. Chamomile? Tomato, tomato. So it looked like ground cover rather than wild field like we had here in the U.S. So chamomile usually grows only about two and a half inches tall, and then they would use it also for cosmetics and some medicine. Certain types of thyme only grow two to three inches tall, so those would be used for lawns and also as medicine. And ancient Egyptians used thyme for embalming. Hmm. The ancient Greeks would use it as an incense when they needed courage. (laughs) And homeowners in the 16 and 1700s, if they wanted their lawn low to the ground, what they used was a scythe. So that's the tool that the Grim Reaper uses. (laughs) So ancient Romans used scythes. Pliny the Elder writes about different types of scythes in his time, around 70 AD. And there's a book you can get. It's called the Scything Handbook. It's written by a master of the scythe. Mm-hmm. And he says it's a great exercise. It works your core muscles rather than using a lawnmower. <laughs> this week we're going to talk about grass seed for your lawn. So some types of grass, like St. Augustine, is mm-hmm. primarily grown from plugs or sprigs. What is but that? We're, so a plug is just a small section of sod. So it's usually two to four inches, and it has the soil, the roots, and the leaves all together. And you would dig a hole and drop this in, and that's how you would plant an area, and it's going to spread. So if you have a bare spot or or if you want to, you can actually do a lawn like that. And then sprigs, it's S-P-R-I-G-S. These are grass stems with the root and leaves on this, but there's no soil on it. These are usually three to six inches long. And you take these and you poke the root part into the soil and you leave the leaf exposed. And that's how you grow with sprigs. So it's kind of interesting. Mm. Grass seed comes in two main types. You have cool season grass and warm season grass. The cool season grass, it grows best in areas that have summer temperatures in the 60 to 80 degree Fahrenheit range. And the cool season grass is going to tolerate cold and freezing winters. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the U.S., that'd be in the northern states. Warm season grass grows best in summer temperatures in the 70 to 95 degree range. And they'll actually go dormant when soil temperatures drop below 65 degrees. Mm. So there's a transition zone in the middle of the country where it's difficult to keep a healthy lawn because it's too cool for warm season grass in the winter Mm -hmm. and it's too hot for cool season grass in the summer. Mm. So popular grass in a transition area is tall fescue, bermuda, centipede, and zoysia, but there's a lot of new seeds that they're developing. And if you're seeding your lawn with a blend of cool and warm season grass, this is going to allow the dominant grass to keep your lawn looking green, depending on the time of year it is, So if you're in a transition area. Hmm. Kentucky bluegrass is a cool season grass, so this does well in areas where it gets cold in the winter. It stands up to foot traffic very well. It can go dormant during drought conditions in summer. Very easy to grow from seed, and it spreads new grass from rhizomes. What's that? So rhizomes are special stems that grow horizontally just under the soil, and then they sprout new grass plants off that stem. Hmm. Interesting. Kentucky bluegrass is originally from Europe and Asia. It likes full sunlight. It doesn't like shade that well. And in your lawn, if you add rye and fescue to bluegrass, it'll make your lawn more tolerant to shade and temperature. So why is it called Kentucky bluegrass? So early pioneers found it growing in big fields in Kentucky, and it's green. But if it's in a big field, it almost has like a hint of blue to it mm. when, when you look at it. And they thought it was really great for, you know, their animals for grazing. So they would ask her, you know, hey, can we get some of that blue grass from Kentucky? And it became Kentucky bluegrass. <laughs> Fescue grass comes in a few varieties. This is a cool season grass. They're tolerant to shade and transition areas. The fine fescues are more cold and shade tolerant than the tall fescue. Mm. 
Perennial ryegrass is a cool season grass, and it germinates quickly, stands up to high traffic areas. It's low maintenance, insect, and disease resistant, and this forms clumps of grass rather than spreading out like bluegrass with the rhizomes. Mm -hmm. And then Bermuda grass, it actually spreads with stolons, so What's it's S-T-O-L-O-N-S, -O -O and this is horizontal stems above the soil, and they sprout new grass. Hmm. You know, the center court at Wimbledon in England mm -hmm. is perennial ryegrass. Centipede grass is a warm season grass. This is good for the southeast part of the U.S. It's native to China and Southeast Asia. So this was brought into the U.S. in the early 1900s for the sandy, acidic soil in the southeast. This will stand up to high heat, but it's not very drought or cold tolerant. Hmm. Bahia, so this is B-A-H-I-A. -A. It's a warm season grass. It likes full sunlight. It's drought and heat tolerant. This was also brought into the U.S. in the early 1900s for pasture lands, and it does well in sandy, acidic soil. Hmm. Zoysia is a warm season grass. It's Z-O-Y-S-I-A. Who gets to name these? Yeah, there's some great names. I'll have to read a couple labels later with the specific trade names. Wow, that'll so, be exciting for our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so zoysia, it's going to tolerate some shade and cold temperatures. It's heat and drought tolerant, low maintenance, and it can take high traffic. Hmm. Some types of zoysia can only be grown from sprigs like St. Augustine, hmm. but there are some types that can be grown from seed. This was brought into the U.S. in the early 1900s. It can do well in transition areas, and it creates a dense lawn. Bermuda is a warm season grass, originally from Africa. Bermuda's from Africa? <laughs> <laughs> so Bermuda needs full sun, it's heat and drought resistant, and it can stand up to high traffic. It's salt tolerant, but it's not tolerant to cold. Hmm. So it's fast growing, it spreads with both rhizomes and stolons, hmm. which is pretty interesting. You so sound very excited This about is that. popular with golf courses and athletic fields. Hmm. The problem is it's a little higher maintenance because of its fast growth, so you're going to have to mow it more often. And to keep a healthy Bermuda lawn, you need to be fertilizing it regularly but okay. it's, it's very popular. When you're shopping for grass seed, you can look up a grass seed zone map on the internet, and that's mm -hmm. going to give you an idea of the best type of grass for your area. And the things you want to compare on the label is how much sunlight does it need? So is it a sunny mix, sun and shade, shade, or dense shade? Rye and the fine fescues do well in partial shade if you're looking for a cool season grass. The zoysia and St. Augustine for warm season and the shady areas are going to be the most difficult place to grow grass. Hmm. Some of the new grass varieties are going to do well in just two to four hours worth of sun a day, so check the label and compare, but most grass requires four to six hours worth of sunlight a day. The sunny mixtures do best with direct sun all day. The sun and shade mixes have a blend of seed, so the dominant grass is going to do well depending on the sunlight. So if you're seeding a small area around your home, you're going to get the best results by matching the mix to the light requirements. Mm -hmm. But if you're seeding a wide area all around your house, sun and shade is going to be the easiest because then the dominant seed will grow wherever the light requirements fit that. Okay. If you're seeding an area that's going to get a lot of foot traffic or wear and tear from kids or pets, you want to look for high traffic on the label. For cool season grass, the tall fescues, Kentucky bluegrass, and perennial ryegrass is going to stand up to foot traffic. For warm season grass, zoysia and bermuda. If you have dogs that run back and forth along a path, like against a fence, mm -hmm. no grass is going to stand up to that. So there you can use mulch or artificial grass to create a walkway or a run for your dogs. Artificial it, grass? Yeah, so you make a little Who's path do for that? <laughs> it's cool. So it, you know, it's going to blend in, so it looks like part of your grass. You should just do the whole yard <laughs> and forget it, artificial grass. So if you have a problem with dog urine killing your grass, some studies have shown that tall fescue Kentucky 31 mm -hmm. is very resistant for cool season and transition areas. Okay. So tall fescue grass was brought into the U.S. from Europe in the 1800s for pastures for food for livestock. Mm -hmm. In 1931, a professor from the University of Kentucky collected and grew a variety of tall fescue that he found on a farm. So he called it Kentucky 31 for the state and the year he discovered it. So this is drought, shade, disease resistant, and it stands up well to foot traffic. Why is everything so, in Kentucky? <laughs> they grow good grass. <laughs> If you're in an area with warm season grass, Bermuda grass is popular for lawns with dogs. It handles traffic well and repairs itself fast. Hmm. 
Another quality you want to look for in the label is grass that's been developed for drought and insect resistance. And many pros are recommending that you overseed your lawn every few years with drought resistant grass and that's going to allow you to conserve water. When you're looking at the grass seed label, you're going to see the name of the company, the type of seed, specific trade names. So grass with trade names have been grown for specific traits like drought resistance or insect resistance. I looked at a couple of bags from the Greenview Grass Seed Company, mm -hmm. and they have names like Da Vinci Tall Fescue, Leonardo Tall Fescue, <laughs> Wild Horse Kentucky Bluegrass, and Van Gogh Tall Fescue. <laughs> When you see purity or percentage on the label, this is the amount of seed by weight in the bag. The germination percentage is the percent that grows in very good conditions in the lab while they're hey. testing it for germination. So you might see any, you know, anywhere from 70 to 90 some percent. And this is under ideal conditions. Right, so you're not gonna have the same results right. in real life. <laughs> right, and also germination is gonna decline with the age of the seed. Hmm. So when you're looking at it, it's going to have the test dates and you wanna compare bags and get the freshest seed. So this is actually a sticker that's on the label? Right. You're also gonna see weed seed percentage and that's the percentage of weed seeds by weight in the bag. Pros are saying look for 0.5% or less. Inert matter is stuff that isn't grass or weed seed. So what the, is it? <laughs> it's just it's stuff that doesn't grow. <laughs> You're going to see noxious weeds, and some of these have to be listed depending on your state. You're going to have a lot number, and that allows you to trace the batch. Origin is going to give you the state that it was grown in. Hmm. If you're putting together a plan for seeding your lawn and want the healthiest grass, you can test the pH of the soil to find out if it's too acidic or alkaline. Mm -hmm. For most grass, a pH of around 6.5 is going to help the plant absorb nutrients properly. Lime is popular to raise the pH and sulfur to lower the pH. Okay. So I spoke to the White Tail Institute and they said if you have a soil pH of around 5, the nutrients in the soil are bound to the soil and plants can't absorb them properly. Hmm. So, so what do you, you do? Well, so Artificial grass? Right. <laughs> no, you do a soil test. So the Whitetail Institute has something that you would take a sample of your soil, they send it to a lab, mm -hmm. and it's going to tell you how much lime or fertilizer you should use, and now you're, it's going to absorb the nutrients properly. Okay. Because if, you're, if you have too high or too low of a pH, and you're spending all this money to fertilize, and if you're spending all this money for grass seed right. that you're putting down, and it can't absorb the nutrients properly, mm -hmm. it's not going to germinate properly, and you're not going to have a healthy lawn. Okay. So a soil pH test is kind of a simple thing you can do. And what's interesting about the Whitetail Institute, mm -hmm. they also sell seeds to grow clover and other plants to attract and feed deer. So it's good if you're a hunter. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> and you can also check with your local university extension for soil tests. Hmm. If you're in an area with cool season grass, the best time to put down your grass seed is in the fall. The second best time is in spring. And you want the soil temperatures to be consistently in that 50 to 65 degree range. The air temperature is going to be 60 to 75. You want to get your seed down at least 45 days before the first frost is estimated in your area. Hmm. So use a soil temperature map you can get online and that's going to give you the best timing to get your grass seed down. Okay. For warm season grass you want soil temperatures in the 65 to 70 degree Fahrenheit range and spring is going to be the best time to plant warm season grass. Hmm. If you're starting a lawn from scratch and you just have bare soil, so for example a new home, you'd want like to use it. Like my parents when they took down their pool in their backyard. That so was... you had a large bare spot? Yeah, it was pretty yeah. big. Like something like that, if the, the soil is very compacted, you'd want to loosen it up. Or if you're in an area where you have a lot of debris, sticks and stones, you'd want to make sure you remove all that till the top two or three inches. You can get a gas tiller, you can rent one at a rental store or a right. home center. You can get fairly inexpensive mini tillers uh -huh. and then you can also use that for gardening. There's a hand tiller, so it's called the garden weasel. It has three tines and it tills down about an inch and a half. Uh -huh. And this is going to loosen the soil. If you do a soil test at this point, you can see what you need to amend the soil. So if you have to raise or lower the pH. Okay. Also, if you're in an area with very sandy soil, you can add compost or any type of organic material and that's going to help the soil hold nutrients and water close to the seeds. Uh -huh. And if you have clay-based soil, 
and it's very compacted, you'd want to add organic material also and till this in the first couple of inches. And that's going to help loosen up the soil. More air and nutrients and water hmm. is going to get to the roots of your grass. You want to rake that soil smooth and grate it away from the house and then add a starter fertilizer. You'd want to use a spreader so you don't put down too much. So check the label and the settings on the spreader. Well, you should and check the label too. Read it because some starter fertilizers you don't put down right away. Right, yeah. Some you have to put down with the grass seed. Others you have to wait like two weeks. Right, exactly. And then also use a spreader for the grass seed and set the spreader to the amount of on the grass label. You want about 15 seeds per square inch for a new lawn, hmm. but check your label. Mm -hmm. Too much seed will actually weaken its growth. Really? And then you want to lightly rake it. You don't want to bury the seeds more than a quarter of an inch down. The key thing is the seeds need to touch soil, mm -hmm. but we want, don't want to get them too deep. And then mist it twice a day for at least two weeks. You want the soil wet, but you don't want water pooling, so it moves the seeds all over. Plus, if it's too wet for too long, and this is a, a good time to check the weather forecast for right. the next couple of weeks, <laughs> because you can actually the seeds can actually rot if they're too wet. Or be washed away. Right, exactly. So you want to mist it twice a day for two weeks. I would say you want it fairly dry, the forecast, so you can control it. Mm -hmm. And depending on your nozzle, it's probably going to take about five to ten minutes in each area after two weeks, you're going to mist it once a day till the grass is about two inches tall. Then you can give the lawn one inch of water a week. Mm -hmm. When the grass is about two and a half inches to three inches tall, you can start to mow it. Exciting. You, you want to make sure that your blade is very sharp for that first mowing. And check the label for the preferred height. Mm -hmm. You have to take the watering part of this process seriously because if you're not going to water it correctly, don't even bother wasting your money on grass seed. Yeah, it won't germinate properly. And it's funny, the forecast, if you have too much rain and there's mm -hmm. too much water, the seeds can rot. If you don't have enough water, and let's say you just start to water the first few days, if the seeds dry out, right. they'll Forget die. It. And if you start to get roots in the new seedling and mm -hmm. they dry out before they really take root and get into the soil, they're going to die. Right. So misting it twice a day for two weeks is, is really kind of the key to success. <laughs> If you plan on adding grass seed to thicken up your lawn and keep it healthy with less weeds, you can overseed. What you would want to do is mow your grass low and bag the clippings. You want to rake the whole lawn thoroughly and remove any thatch or debris you pull up. And this is going to also scratch up the surface of the soil. Mm -hmm. You need the seeds to touch soil to germinate. And this is also a good time to core aerate. So that's when you create these plugs. You dig out these about two inch deep plugs, mm -hmm. and this is going to soften up hard soil. It's going to allow air and nutrients and water into the soil. And you can actually leave those plugs on top of the grass and they decompose. It's gonna add nutrients to it. Right, so you can rent one of these or there's companies that will do it for you. Yeah, pretty inexpensive mm -hmm. to do this. And if you do this every few years, it'll actually have a, you'll have a healthier lawn. You can also add a top dressing if you're overseeding. So you can use that top. really called a top dressing. Yes, a thin layer of either topsoil or lawn soil. Hmm. And the lawn soils have a blend of organic material. It's going to hold nutrients, amend the existing soil, and some have a starter fertilizer added to it. Right. So you want to rake this into the lawn. Just put a small amount down. You don't want to cover up the existing grass. And then you're going to put down your seed. Mm hmm. You want to use a spreader and make sure you look at the bag for the rate for overseeding. It's usually about half of the seed per inch compared to bare soil. So about eight seeds per square inch and then mist it twice a day for at least two weeks. And if you're going in an existing lawn after two weeks, then you'd want to make sure that your lawn's getting about an inch worth of water a week mm -hmm. till it's fully established. Okay. For bare spots in your lawn, they have seed mixes that have grass seed, fertilizer, and mulch, and you just pour it over the bare spot, and that mulch will help hold the moisture next to the seeds mm -hmm. for better germination. And if it's a small area, you really just have to take a rake and just scratch up the surface. As long as the soil is touching the seed, it's going to germinate, Right. but then the key is misting it twice a day for two weeks. You can get grass seed that has a coating on it to hold moisture and help it germinate. And some of these coatings have a fungicide or endophytes. What is and that? So endophytes are either an organism, it's like a fungal organism or a bacteria that actually will live inside the grass and protect it from insects. So this is a good thing? Science. <laughs>
I've got some germination times. Okay. So how long it takes you to see the grass breaking through the soil. Mm -hmm. Kentucky bluegrass takes about 7 to 14 days, depending on the type. Fine fescue, 7 to 14 days. Tall fescue, 6 to 14 days. Perennial ryegrass, 5 to 10 days. Annual ryegrass, as quick as 3 days. Wow. Some of these germinate. Although they don't come back next year, which is weird. I don't even know why you'd put down an, an annual ryegrass. Bermuda, 5 to 12 days. Centipede, 10 to 28 days, so mm. quite a while. Bahia, 14 to 28 days. And Zoysia, 10 to 21 days. Wow. And those grass seeds with the longer germination times, I would miss those twice a day for three weeks. Okay. You forgot to say don't walk on new grass seed until it's time to mow. Right. Great tip. You want to mow in the morning or evening when the grass is dry. If you're mowing in the middle of the day in hot, direct sunlight, it can damage some grass. Hmm. And then mowing in different directions is going to keep your grass standing up better. And some studies are saying it can actually be healthier for the lawn. Hmm. You only want to remove about a third of the leaf when you're mowing. And the longer you keep your grass, the longer the roots are going to be. And it's going to help produce more food. It shades the soil, and it's going to prevent some weed seeds from germinating. It also keeps the soil cooler, and it reduces evaporation. So in general, the northern grass, so the cool season grass, you want to keep around 3 inches long, and the warm season grass around 2 inches long. Right. But depending on the grass you have in your lawn, then check what's recommended. Right. You want to sharpen your lawnmower blade before every season, and for warm season grass, sharpen it twice a season, and that's going to help prevent some lawn disease. Mm -hmm. Most pros are recommending mulch your grass. The clippings are going to add nutrients and organic material to the soil. And then give your lawn about one inch worth of water a week. You can use a water gauge to figure out how much water is going into an area. So if you're using a sprinkler, set up a water gauge, and now you know how long to leave that sprinkler in one area to get one inch worth of water. Right. I spoke to Gardens Alive about grass seed, and they have their own research farm where they test seeds and plants and fertilizers. They're saying that some of the biggest mistakes homeowners make is not planting at the right time. So for cool season grass, plant it in fall. For warm season grass, in spring. Mm. And then also not getting the right type of seed for the amount of sunlight. So make sure you're matching it to sun, sun and shade, or shady type seed. Using too much synthetic fertilizer, they say, depletes the soil over time. It hurts the microorganisms in the soil, and it helps build up thatch. Mm. They also said their Turf Alive 3 is an interesting seed for homeowners. So it contains endophytes that actually make the grass poisonous to sodweb worms, cutworms, aphids, cinch bugs, and other insects. Wow. Fascinating, huh? Mm -hmm. They also have the seed that contains rhizomes, so the seed allows the roots to grow horizontally and quickly fill in bald spots, and it increases the resiliency against stress and disease. Cool. I also spoke to Greenview about some grass seed tips, and they said one mistake homeowners make is not using a starter fertilizer. So when the grass seed starts to germinate, it uses all the nutrients inside the seed. And when the seedlings have the roots in the soil, mm -hmm. they need that fertilizer to help it grow properly. Mm -hmm. And also, don't put down too many seeds too close together. It causes the seedlings to fight for room and nutrients. Mm -hmm. And you're actually going to have weak or thin areas where you put down too many seeds. <laughs> And then the most important step is make sure you cover the grass seed. So they're saying rake it in no deeper than a quarter inch. And they recommend their Greenview Fairway Formula Seed Success. So this is a biodegradable mulch with a fertilizer, and this holds the seeds in place and it helps retain moisture. Yeah. Another thing they emphasized is never use weed killers or crabgrass control before you seed an area. Because most crabgrass control won't let anything germinate for like three months. Right. Some top-rated grass seed, Greenview, Gardens Alive, Pennington, so it's P-E-N-N-I-N-G-T-O-N, -N -N Scott's, Baron Brug, it's B-A-R-E-N-B-R-U-G, and Jonathan Green. For spreaders, Scott's, Chapin, C-H-A-P-I-N, and Agrifab, A-G-R-I-F-A-B. For starter fertilizer, Greenview, Pennington, and Scott's. Do you have anything else to add? Make sure you're picking the right seed for your area, so warm or cool season grass. Match the amount of sunlight the area is getting. 
The seeds need to touch soil to germinate and mist it twice a day for at least two weeks. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, the Google Play Music app, iHeartRadio, and CastBox. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. And you can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.